So good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for staying for the second half. Uh, we've had a, a really fantastic first panel, and I can see there are some really fantastic uh, themes developing, which I'm sure this panel will pick up on and uh, much will resonate. I'm going to try and keep the introductions very short to allow the speakers more time. Uh, so first up, uh, we'll have Professor Joy Owen, who um, has, is visiting from South Africa, from the University of Free State. Okay. And I've, I've got to do this, sorry. <laughs> when I sit there, the energy starts to go weird, and I get tongue-tied, so I've got to pace to get rid of it. Okay. As always, my brain is thinking about all the possible ways to do this presentation, um, even now, based on the wonderful presentations that we gave in the first half, as well as the plenary um, speaker and discussion. And I think the best, the best way to start is to kind of give you a bit of a story. Okay. So, as an anthropologist by saying, but also by um, love affair, the appreciation of, of having fallen in love with anthropology and what it could offer in terms of trying to understand what it means to be a human being. Um, I find myself in this space where I was going to look at Congolese migrants as a South African in South Africa. Okay. Um, and I had a bit of a moment because we were always trained to think that you need to actually study the exotic other and that the studying of that exotic other would occur outside of your home space. Right. So if I was following the form, the disciplinary form, I wouldn't be doing fieldwork in South Africa, number one. I wouldn't be doing it in Cape Town, which is my <coughs> origin. Um, and that's about where it would end, because I was looking at the national other. Right. So for some people who have been in the discipline in South Africa for an extended period of they found that intriguing because they said, well, um, people of, of your color, colored people, or black people would often study their own. Right? And I was very clear from the beginning that I wasn't going to do that. And I felt that I couldn't do that because I was too close to. And I still believed then that you need objectivity in order to understand another. So it made sense to then look at Congolese migrants because I actually saw them. They were this new way of speaking, engaging, walking, dressing. And of course, your interest is peaked, right? Because all of a sudden, your eye goes, your eye goes. Ooh, different. Right? And you want to understand it. So how do you start to do that? Well, through immersion. So anthropology is well known for that, participant observation. I always say to people, uh, you get weirded out when you realize you're observing and not participating. And then you feel you're participating and not observing. And then when you start to write, you realize you've actually done both. Okay. So for me, um, in some ways, being an, an ethnographer, I'd say that, being an ethnographer rather than a biographer is a little... Uh, schizophrenic in some ways. I tend to feel like I have multiple personality disorder because I'm constantly aware of who I am in the South African reference, South African history. But I'm also aware of what I'm not. I'm not Congolese, I'm not male. So how, how do I end up speaking to three Congolese men? How do I become a part of their lives? How do I become a part of their social network? Through luck. Literally through luck. Had it not been for a friend of mine who had a brother who knew of a South African who was assisting Congolese men and women, but predominantly men, the research would never have happened, I think. Okay. Because at once, as an introverted kind of leader, holding, holding space, and his home was that. So instead of walking around in Musenberg trying to figure out, uh, can I have a conversation with you? Would you be interested in doing this research? I had a space to go to. I had an African that I could engage with, who then acted as the gatekeeper to my research participants. Now, I call them research participants at the start, but they are actually family. And so 
But let's be clear about that. And let me be very clear that as a result, you cannot say that my presentation is objective. It's not. So in the process of getting to know them between 2004 and 2009, because I also had a job, <laughs> it was strange how I was able to access parts of their lives, but not everything. And how now, years later, I go, that was but just one chapter in their book. And if I really think about it, one chapter in our book. So even as I was writing, I was writing as if, you know, I was experiencing this right now. So time becomes important. This is it. I'm writing as if I am here. The ethnograph is present. And if you read the text, or if you read the monograph, you will feel that. You will feel that movement of I'm present, I'm in it. Right? How did, how did I do that? Paul Stoller's work on sensuous scholarship, sight, sound, smell. Literally trying to put you next to me, where I was. And in the process, really understanding that I was crafting our story. I couldn't remove myself from it. Every time I wanted to write something, excising myself, I couldn't. So again, coming to that understanding, Buddha Oakley's understanding, that you are the primary instrument of your research. Right? You can talk about methods, but you are the person employing those methods. And you have a story, you have a history, you have a contemporary moment, you also have the future. So as I was writing the contemporary moment, I was also writing the historical moment. So we biographers might do life history work. I wasn't really doing life history. I was trying to understand what was happening in that moment because in the media, social media, um, all African migrants were undocumented. They were asylum seekers. They were stealing South African jobs. They were stealing South African women. Right? They were a burden on South African resources. So the country in and of itself <coughs> has a reputation of being xenophobic. And I made the conscious decision not to write those stories. Conscious decision. So what did I come out with? xenophobia rather than xenophobia. Relationships mm -hmm. between Congolese men and European women. Between Congolese men and South African women. The importance of social networks and the diversity of those social networks. So, including South Africans. Right? The importance of religion. And how being able to actually open yourself as the migrant to those who seem to be other gives you access to information that other people don't have. So rather than tell this woeful tale of Congolese men and women who were, because it really is, sometimes South Africa came through like an abyss. Okay, it, it was meant to be a, lo a launch pad somewhere else. You can get stuck because of the administrative nightmare. You need documents and more documents and more documents. And homophilic is inundated with, and I'm going to say it, <laughs> with inefficient people. And so it leads to people just trying to eat out a living in South Africa, which really isn't as, um, it's not quite third world and it's not quite first world. It's an in-between. Okay? So the country in and of itself is also still in transition. And it finds it hard to deal with people who are in transition. But my understanding was when I was working with them, I came to understand that they are not in transition. They are still living their lives as if they are going to be here tomorrow. They're not living their lives as migrants. The administrative structure exists, but they're living as people. They love, they play music, they worship, they have issues with each other, they disagree, they disagree with me. <coughs> We get irritated with each other. We create spaces of belonging. Yeah? So they are living their lives not outside of time. It's in South African time. So consistently being in place while being out of place. And so for me at least, when I think about writing 
the lies of others. It's to remember that time is important. It's very simple. You can't quite capture it. You keep thinking it's hours and hours and hours. But if like me, you come to Europe and the sun is still up at past nine at night, you go, what an uncivilized country. <laughs> it should be dark by now. Okay? From the south, understanding that landscape is different. But so too time. Yeah? And also, and I think I'm going to end here, also context. So while we think about the biography and you might want to think in terms of history, you also got to think about the social political context in which you are writing. And not only in terms of framing them, but also framing yourself. So as a woman who is externally identified as coloured and South African, it was rare. I'm, I'm a rare bird. Okay? In the sense of doing anthropological field work at a doctoral level. That has to be understood. And so I asked myself, okay, if this is real, do I belong? Am I allowed to write the story? Can I write the story? If all I've ever been told is that actually life story is about you. Okay. And I think that ties up to the earlier session. So it starts to become really difficult when you listen to how you are being defined in the academy, and when you choose to ignore it, the writing becomes easier, but also more difficult. Because it means that you have to listen. You really have to listen, not to what you think, but what your research family says. You really have to pay attention to what they do, and you have to start matching what they do with what they say. And when it doesn't match, you have to ask the question, what happened? So it asks for a different kind of sensitivity. It asks for a level of, how is it was, thinking around double consciousness, being able to enter and exit, finding entrances and exits where none actually exists being able to sit with the discomfort. When I teach, I always say to students, anthropology is uncomfortable. It gets you to question everything you think you know. And instead of trying to find the answer, you have to sit with the discomfort. And in writing, you have to do the same. I should have mentioned that the theme for this panel is epistemologies, methodologies, and theoretical perspectives. So um, to start to see some of these themes coming through. Thanks very much, Joy. And, and next up, we have Professor Santana Das, uh, who recently came to Oxford from King's College London, and uh, has written uh, some amazing books about first world literature and the census. So I understand you're going to give us a, a different uh, angle on that today. Uh, thank you. Uh, first, many thanks, Katie, for the invitation. Many thanks to Nayanika also for facilitating it. And thanks for some just fantastic papers. And some of the phrases I have written down, they are very resonant for my talk today. And they are fragments of a life and insignificant lives. And then the sound, smell, and sight that you were talking about the relationship between the individual and the collective. And I, I'm just going to, last year I published a book on India and the fir and First World War. And I'll briefly talk about that. What I'm interested in is, uh, is how do we recover the texture of the past? And for me, a uh, big challenge was how to understand what Raymond Williams calls the structure of feeling uh, kind of from the past. And it's a combination, I would say, of life writing, biography, and history. And often, I'm not sure kind of where the thresholds lie. So I will start with the voice of an Indian prisoner of war, Mal Singh, uh, who was held at Wunsdorf in Germany during the First World War. And I hope you can see. And this is a recording from. Yes. Is that 
fits or not, I think. एक आदमी थी शेर मांस खाता है मक्खन खाता थी हिंदुस्तान में दो से दूध पीता थी आदमी उस किसे आदमी ने उस उसने अंग्रेजा की नौकरी की वो आदमी दूध की लड़ाई लड़ाई जो आ गया वो सब आदमी लूट this is among the 3,000 sound recordings made by the Royal Prussian Phonographic Commission between 1915 and 1918. Mal Singh was made to stand in front of the phonograph machine held before him by his German captors and instructed to read or recite something. Instead, spectacularly, he turned an ethnological experiment into one of the most moving testimonies. Desolate, homesick, and hungry, he distilled all the pain and longing into the image of the ghee or butter and the two says of milk. Home is remembered on the palate as taste. Or to move from sound to touch. Here we have this kind of almost kind of ballet of this kind of hands, and we have this white uniformed hand guiding this dark and dark and blackened hand. And the caption says, an Indian unable to read is accepting, sorry, unable to write is putting his thumb impression on the pay book. The camera, Walter Benjamin would say, knew. Insurgent under this touch, across the line of color, is not just the story of war recruitment, but the history of the asymmetries of race and colonialism. This brisk bureaucratic touch that you see on the left is answered by a more lingering caress on the right, where similarly a non-literate soldier leans forward to thank the scribe who's writing the letter as he dictates. Thank you for writing the letter, my friend. The hand seems to say, as the body fills in the gap left by language. Between 1914 and 1918, in a grotesque reversal of Joseph Conrad's vision, hundreds of thousands of South Asians, Pacific Islanders, and Africans, or largely people from what I guess would now, we would now consider to be the global South, were traveling to the heart of whiteness and beyond Mesopotamia, East Africa, Gallipoli, to serve in the First World War, and of them, kind of people from undivided India, they comprise some one and a half million, kind of the highest kind of number of men from the colonies. Now, stuck as they were in the no man's land between Eurocentric narratives and nationalistic discourses in these former colonies, they raise for me a far more fundamental problem. How does one recover the lives of people who did not know how to read or write? I guess a problem widely shared across the global south. How can one do a more intimate history from below? I started visiting museums, archives, as well as some of the communities from where these men came, and they were largely men, the one who went to fight. Amnesia, I realized, is not absence, and this is something Professor Choudhury also touched upon. <coughs> For example, I came across lots of artifacts on the left bloodstained glasses, kind of which were shipped back to India after this Indian Dr. Jogensen died in France. Or here from Pitt Rivers, uh, it's a German helmet adorned with kind of horns and hair found with the Naga laborers. Or was it a headhunting trophy? We do not know. I'm just rushing through them. On the left, it's a diary I came across in the Australian. War Memorial, where an Indian Sipo had written his name in three languages, showing how this, you know, religions and languages kind of existed simultaneously in kind of undivided kind of pre-partition Punjab. Or on the right, this is extraordinary by a person who actually deserted, Mir Must. And I came across his French notebook. In fact, it was in a sealed envelope. And after 90 years, they gave me the permission kind of to open the envelope. And I was thinking I'd come across words like jihadi or Bharat or nationalism or something. 
and instead this is what we realize that you know when you are 20 years kind of old and when you're in the trenches this is what you think about and I think it's a good reality check for the overpowered post-colonial or subaltern <laughs> scholar but for me the most moving thing was this one it's a letter written by a 12 year old Punjabi girl and she's writing to her father kind of who's serving in Egypt basically saying that daddy I'm learning how to read and write so that when you write back home I don't have to take the letters to the post office to the, for the postal clerk to read it, so I can read it out to my mother so you can write whatever you want to. Suddenly we realize that the Punjabi home front and the war front in Egypt or France, they are not all that afar. I also realized that how we cannot think of war as combat, it's conflict, it's not combat Gnosticism, but it affects obviously kind of men, women and children. Now, why are these fragments important? <clears throat> the voice recording, the glasses, the torn diary page, or this kind of letter by this young girl, they are not just new sources, but provided me with new ways of understanding the past. These fugitive fragments evoke the sensuous body, the flotsam and jetsam, of life wrecked by war as it reduces it to piecemeal narratives. So perhaps there's a particular relationship to times of conflict. They confront us both with the possibilities and the limits of material fragments. Sorry, I have a problem because I've got the wrong glasses, so I can't always kind of see the script, so that's why I'm kind of slightly kind of stumbling. So. Okay. They are the archives of touch and intimacy, the contact zone where testimony is often born. And yet, in the absence of context, they often tease us with their silence. And again, I'm reminded of Professor Choudhury's kind of idea of this kind of subterranean memory, this thorny underworld, and it's there, and once you start delving, it all kind of comes out with some resistance. Now, in recent years, the cultural turn in First World War studies has revolutionized not just war studies, but changed the very template of how we do cultural history, and indeed, how we make meaning of past conflicts. And yet, they have largely been limited to Europe and the States. There have been some excellent social, economic, and military histories, but not that many experiential or even cultural histories of 20th century conflict from Asia or Africa or even South America. I may be wrong and I'd be very kind of grateful to be corrected. And I think to do a cultural and emotional history of the global South, particularly from below, requires us partly to de-Europeanize our tools as well as our sources. I don't want to fetishize cultural difference, but I'll try to explain what I mean. While not abandoning traditional sources, it becomes crucial to visit, if possible, anthropologists like the sites and communities these people came from, raid the archives of other countries whose war histories intersected with theirs, also to move beyond the text into images, oral histories, sounds, images, as well as, and I think most important, to know what questions to ask of this new material, rather than falling back into the tra trap of asking you know, the same questions, because the histories can be quite radically different of conflicts. Rather than, for example, eternally going on about the question of whether the South Asian soldiers were merely imperial sentinels or seasoned mercenaries, whether they had any agency or not, it is important to move beyond these categories and instead try to understand as far as possible their kind of structures of feeling at that particular moment. And I think anthropology for me had been a very, very kind of important discipline to kind of do these moves. Second, in a context where the majority of the people were non-literate, the official archives more than silent, and the post-colonial nation states themselves profoundly ambivalent about their kind of imperial kind of past, kind of, kind of the engagement of their own people in imperial wars, it is necessary to redefine the archive. In my case, it necessitated both a vertical and horizontal 
expansion. By vertical, for me, it meant recovering the histories from the non-literate village woman singing this laments to Tagore, the Nobel laureate kind of Tagore, speaking about war and nationalism in the, in the States kind of during the war years. But more difficult was the horizontal kind of expansion. And by that, what I mean is, as I said, kind of going beyond the text and to have a more engaged dialogue between the visual, for example, you know, to think about recruitment in India, I looked at war posters, then I kind of, after kind of trouble, I came across recruitment songs, and then some poems that were commissioned that were read out. So this is one particular segment, but at the same time, there's also resistance. So then I came across some folk paintings about farewell, lament, women's lament, asking the men to stay back. Women's kind of writing at that time. And it's the entanglement between each of these three things, but also the entanglement between the two sets. And I think that's the first step we have to do in order to understand. And I think it just, one just needs to spend lots and lots of time, I guess. And then from that kind of base level, I then kind of moved to understanding the differences between censored letters and diaries kind of unpublished, putting them in dialogue with photographs, particularly when there are kind of analogies or kind of symmetries between passages in letters and diaries and photographic evidence. And then integrating different kinds of visual kind of material. And I do think that we need to engage with visual material produced by European artists. Subaltern scholars have often been quite reluctant, whereas I think subaltern life can actually flicker under the kind of process of kind of European painters. And then making the final move, uh, going to memoirs. And I don't have time. There have been some extraordinary kind of diaries and memoirs I found, including the diaries, which is not there, of Amar Singh, who I think wrote one of the longest diaries, I think from when he was 15 years old to when he died at the age of 70. And during the war years, he wrote this kind of 18 volume diary each and every day of the four years. He wrote his kind of diary. It's not there. Then Abila Baghdad, this extraordinary uh, me uh, memoir, I'd say, reminiscence by an 83-year-old lady, Makhada Devi, uh, about her grandson who died in Mesopotamia. The limits, with the threshold between autobiography and biography gets confused there. Other things, and then fiction, and I'll come to fiction in a moment. Fiction written at kind of different points. I just wanted to kind of give an example of the layering and I'm there, I'm there, yes. And, and, and the last point, what I wanted to capture through this thickening is not just the diversity, but rather this old fashioned term, the texture of experience, the structure of feeling. For example, the letters are often obsessed with the image of the heart. My heart is not at home. I, my heart is sadly failing. And it is how can we capture echoes of this kind of very you know, human kind of, kind of liberal humanist heart. And I think that the letters are the kind of Indian literature of the trenches. And the German writer Novalis said, and I quote, novels arise out of the shortcomings of history. So once we have done this archaeological and this cultural kind of reconnaissance or investigation, to see how these things are in turn remembered, represented, and put in the formal sensuous space of the literature. And that's what I do in the final three chapters in my book. And I mentioned this because I think in the, and Elek and I had been in a couple of kind of things together in the last few days, and I gave a response. And I think literary critics are increasingly asking epistemological and ontological questions out of the literary material. And I think one needs to do some of this cultural history and this kind of touch of reality and not just lit crit in order to ask and answer these questions. At the same time, you really also need the sensuousness of form and attention to the formal aesthetics. So I think on one hand, you need the touch of history, whatever that may be, life writing, biography, cultural history, and the sensuousness of form in order to plumb this, what I keep on saying in this you know, very old fashioned liberal humanist way, this texture of experience or structure. And I haven't come across any formula or theory, and I'll just end with someone who in fact founded this center, and it is her resistance to theory that I found most useful, actually. And she says, like, you know, biography, life writing, they're all scrambled. 
gossip, rumor, they're all run together. And what we need is to capture these fleeting glimpses of the body, you know, running through all the kinds of material I've been talking about. Thanks. So good afternoon. First, I'd like to thank, of course, the University of Oxford, Torch, Olson College, Mellon Foundation. Uh, they made possible for me to be, I was here last year for three months and then made, made it possible for me to come back. And of course, to the people involved, Ramon Saro, Elizabeth Ewart, Catherine Collins, Thomas. And also I must, uh, I feel I have to apologize a little bit for my uncertain English and also but also and mainly for the fact that I've tried to talk about two things I'm not really very used to, that is, biographies and global south. <laughs> anyway, I'll try. Uh, in his famous controversy with Sartre about the nature of historical knowledge, Claude Lévi-Strauss wrote something that always made me wonder if everyone actually has a biography. I quote him. As we believe that we... Here it is. As we believe that we apprehend the trend of our personal history as a continuous change, historical knowledge appears to confirm the evidence of inner sense. There would be plenty to say about this supposed totalizing continuity of the self, which seems to me, which seems to, me to be an illusion sustained by the demands of social life, and consequently a reflection of the external on the internal, rather than the object of an apodictic experience. And of course, this is 1962, La Pensée Sauvage. However, on the other hand, when sketching what he calls uh, the silhouette of an anthropological theory, uh, Alfred Gell locates the, no, God, uh, locates the singularity of, anthropolo of anthropology precisely in what he calls its biographical depth. And I quote, the view taken by anthropology of social agents att attempts to replicate the time perspective of these agents on themselves, whereas sociology is often supra-biographical and social or cognitive psychology are infra-biographical. Infra anthropology, therefore, tends to focus on the act in the context of the life, or more precisely, the stage of life of the agent. Anthropologists typically view relationships in a, bio, in a biographical context, by which I mean that relationships are seen as part of a biographical series entered into, a, a, in, enter into at different phases of the life cycle. Anthropological relationships are real and biographically consequential ones, which articulate to the agent's biographical life project." End of quote. Well, Alfred Gell's formulation reminds us uh, for the obvious that, you know, writing biographies is something about writing life, and I stress the word life, life histories or life stories, uh, because there is a slight difference between English and Portuguese. I mean, in Brazilian Portuguese, we do not have the two words. We only have one word, which is historia, which is history. And we don't have, I mean, there exists a historia, story, but it is kind of uh, incorrect. Anyway, I'm not sure if this is an advantage of a disadvantage of the English language, but I will be back uh, to this. Anyway, if, this, uh, if the second term, history, uh, leads directly to the difficulty raised by Levi Strauss, I think that the first term, story, puts us on the trail suggested by Gell. A life story is not to be necessarily confused with a personal history, as they translated Lévi-Strauss, actually, in French is not the same thing, but anyway. Well, as I told some of you last year, the Afro-Brazilian religion called Candomblé was the very first topic I studied as an anthropologist, and now, after some years, I'm back with Candomblé again. So this relationship between me and Candomblé, people in Candomblé, started more than 35 years ago when I was looking for a terreiro, that is a temple, uh, where I could carry my field work. And in one of those stro strokes of luck that, trans that can transform a biography, my own biography, I was taken with Tânia Lima to the terreiro of Matamba Tombensi Neto in the, in the, in the medium-sized town of Ilhéus in the south coast of the state of Bahia in the beginning of the northeast of Brazil. There, me and Tanya met 
Well, this is also Ilhéus, not bad. <laughs> and uh, uh, there I met Dona Yusa Rodrigues, which is the saint mother, that means the priestess of this terreiro. And uh, that she's still now, she's still the, the priestess of the terreiro, and she, she, now, she has now been the head of the terreiro for more than 45 years. Sure. Uh, it was a Saturday or Sunday, I never remember, afternoon in January 1983, we were introduced to this beautiful woman who looked much less than her nearly 50 years old then and her, and her 14 children. She invited us to sit in the yard in the front of the terreiro. This, uh, this picture is from the 90s, it's not from the 80s, but anyway, it was a little bit like that in the 80s. It's not like that anymore, as you'll see. Uh, she invited us to sit in the yard in front of her house, which is located next to the temple. The, the house here, the temple there. And there, with, uh, I would say, an almost tangible force, she began to tell us the centenarian history of her terreiro, which is also the story of her family and her own story. This is my life, she told us very, very clearly. In 1996, I resumed my research in Ilhéus, and I promised her that I was going to help her to write the book that would tell, that would tell this story. She wanted it very much. Only 15 years later, I could keep my promise. One of my problems was, in the beginning, I thought I was going to write the book and sign the book. But when I started to work on that, I noticed it was impossible to do it. I could not sign the book. So I decided to be the ghostwriter of the book. This was a sort of solution. This is the book. It will, I think I have it here. This is the, the, the Tejero today, more or less. This is the place where we sat long ago, and this is the book. Uh, so I went to Ilhéus, and over the course of two months, we alternated the writing of the text. It's reading aloud to Dona Yusa because she cannot read, or she reads, this, or she reads very, very hard for her to read. So I wrote based on interviews I made with her for 20 years, and then I read the end of the end of the after, beginning of the evening, end of the afternoon. I read it to her. And then she made her corrections, alterations, and additions. We, are, we were really moved throughout the writing process. And this always made me believe that somehow in the book, there is something of this force that everyone who knows Dona Ayusa has already felt. Well, in Portuguese, the word tempo means the historical becoming, that is time. But also it means weather. But tempo is also one of the divinities worshipped in this terreiro. African divinity of Bantu origin. Well, trying to bring these two or three senses together, my only real personal contribution to the book uh, was to propose that the book should be called Do Lado do Tempo, something like On the Side of Time, a uh, sort of anti Proustian title, because nobody there ever seemed to be, to be in search of lost time. On the contrary, they always seem to be on the side of time, in both senses of the word, of course. But, it's, uh, but it also has a kind of religious tone, because tempo, as a divinity, is the divinity who singles out the so-called Angola nation among the other nations of Brazilian candomblé. There are at least three big nations, and uh, tempo is the, the Angola divinity par excellence. And I was really happy when they told me, they, they not only accepted the title, but they told me that it was very, very strong. <laughs> uh, I was told that soon after the book was published, many people read the book around the terreiro. Oh, this is already inside. People just, they sat around there and they, would, they had, they had the, the, the copies of the book and they read it a little bit. And, uh, and they said they, felt things, as they say. They started to feel things when reading uh, the book. They felt, for example, the, pres the presence of Dona Yusa's mother, who was the older, the, the older priestess of the Tejero, and she had died long ago, but they could feel her. That's perhaps because, maybe unlike us, they know that the life story, and even a book that tells a life story, participates in this uh, life, in this story, and therefore transport something of what that life was, of the beings and the forces that went through that life. That's why candomblé, candomblé people like to read some of the books written by anthropologists, historians. They like to read the books written about them, 
not so much because the books are good or bad representations of their own religion, but because whether authors like it or not, whether authors know it or not, uh, they, and therefore their books, participate in the forces they give testimony to. Uh, I also believe that for the people of the Terreiro, the, the book presents at least two more dimensions. First, I don't know, Ayusa told me many times, writing her history on paper means that, will, that it will not be lost and that no one will have the right to doubt it. And secondly, it is a matter of spreading the name of the Terreiro around the world because spreading that name is at the, thing, uh, is at the same time spreading the strength of the Terreiro. After all, the Terreiros, the temples of Afro-Brazilian religions, can perfectly be understood as a sort of huge machines intended to capture, to distribute, and to make circulate the force that some Terreiros call Axé, some Terreiros call Ungunzu, and some others just say energy or force. Uh, so they, they, they try to capture, distribute, and circulate this force uh, a force that in their cosmologies constitutes everything that exists and can exist in the universe. In this sense, a book about the Terreiro can be seen as something not, not so different from the beings and people that are consecrated in the temple. They are all vehicles of that force they participate in. Of course, for me, the book brings into play other dimensions. First, when I read it to Dona Yusa in order to complete and correct it, it was impossible not to realize how fragile, fragile what we believe we know about others is. A conclusion I added to two previous experiences, which together may, pars may partially explain my present difficulty to write my own book about Candomblé. In 2006, I was invited by them to give a lecture in the temple a lecture about Candomblé. Uh, it was the first time I had to try to expose to the very people who taught me Candomblé the little I knew about Candomblé. Uh, anyway, uh, so this led me for the first time, this was 2006, to think about our, this, uh, this question of our will to tell the truth about others rather than simply try to map out other truths. Two years later, 2008, they called me for a lecture in the State University in, in Ilhéus. There, I quoted this very famous pa passage by Evans Preacher, I quote, in the way that the Azandi conceived them, which is evidently could not exist. I quote doing like that all the time, of course, you know, <laughs> as anthropologists used to do. You know, that, still do. It's the very definition of an anthropologist, somebody who, you know, does like that. You know? <laughs> Anyway, so what I, I wanted to suggest there is uh, that it, 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 for me, it, apparently, it was easier for an, an anthropologist, because I worked first with politics and else then religion, then politics, then religion again. So I wanted to suggest that, it, in a way, it was easier to listen to what people say about gods than what about they said about polit politicians, you know? And of course, because as we are certain, again, I did like that, I, I, we are, we, we, I meant me, of course, but anyway. Uh, we are certain that gods do not exist. I was doing like this all the time. Nothing they say about the gods can really, can really challenge our knowledge. As, but what they say about politicians and politics, something we believe exists, but they not always do, uh, it's, it's more difficult for us because it really challenges uh, what we, we, what we, one of our beliefs not one of them believed. Anyway, I was doing this all the time, but of course, when I finished it, this was the university, but of course, a regional university. One of the students was clearly a member of one of the Afro-African-Brazilian religions. Of course, he observed to me that I was being ethnocentric and etc., etc. so I apologized anyway. Uh, and uh, finally, another dimension deployed by the book refers precisely to the theme uh, on which I worked during my first research in, in Tom Bensi, my master's actually, in the 80s. And uh, what we used to call, at least in Brazil in those times, notions of personhood. The, my, 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 my thesis was about possession, spiritual possession, and notions of personhood. Well, since my master's thesis, I tried to show that in Candomblé, as in most human societies, the person is presumed to be multiple and layered 
composed of a series of material and immaterial elements. In Candomblé, these elements include at least the main divinity to whom the person belongs, as they say, a variable number of secondary divinities, but also ancestral spirits, other kinds of spirits, <coughs> a guardian angel, a soul, etc., etc. The, the list is not always closed. This means, of course, that when Dona Yusa tells their, her, their life story, this story necessarily includes at least some of the stories of some of the entities that make up her person. Dona Yusa's life story, maybe I have it, so here, so this is, wait, wait. so this is Dona Yusa, this is one of her, one of the mains, this is, she's possessed by her main divinity here. This is 83, it's one of the few pictures I still have from 83. So she, she, the main divinity, here another divinity, here this, the meridian spirit that also possesses her, and this is the, the place where this, the, the meridian spirit goes. This is Dona Yusuf with uh, 13 years old. This is the, 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 I mean the temple, the, the sitting of the ancestors, and uh, this is her mother. Leave her mother there. So it means that when Dona Yusuf tells her life story, it includes the stories of some of the entities that make up her, her own person. Dona Yusuf's life story includes not only the histories of her ancestors and descendants, but also the stories of the divinities to whom she belongs, the childish spirit that is their interpreter, the trickster spirit who is their messenger, the Amerindian spirit that accompanies her through life, and so on. This histo these histories and stories are not always congruent or harmonic, and all kinds of conflict can emerge between the beings that are their protagonists. So to conclude, maybe we might go back to Alfred Gell. Somebody said it before here today. Go back to Alfred Gell and suggest that the biographical character with which he seeks to single out anthropolo anthropological practice should be, in a way, complemented with another idea that he also developed, the idea of the distributed person. And that, and, and that the life stories that make up the very material of anthropology could be understood as sort of distributed histories or stories requiring, requiring distributed theories. Thank you very much. Fantastic, thanks very much. Uh, so next we have Professor Ronald Sorrow, our very own here in anthropology at Oxford. This is the family sort of. Ah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, I thought you said Ramon or family. Yeah, Ramon, no, not, not, <laughs> almost, not my, well, in a way it's my family now, but it's, it's her family. <laughs> uh, but Ramon, you've written a lot on religion and, uh, and on this, uh, invention of texts. So I'll leave the rest to you. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, and, and, and thank you, everybody, for listening to me. Um, <clears throat> in these situations, I sometimes remember one of my lecturers in philosophy in, in, in Barcelona, in Spain, who you could see he was very anxious about talking in front of students. He had a, an anxiety disorder, and sometimes he came to the class and said, I can see you're very tired. We better go home. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, this is to say that, you know, it's, it's, uh, after all these talks, uh, it's quite difficult for me to try to say something um, new. Um, and perhaps I shouldn't even try. But let me tell you what my, my thoughts are and what I've been doing. I'm very interested in individuals and the role of individuals in history, and particularly in African history and African anthropology. <clears throat> um, I reread the Nuer, the famous monograph by Evans Pritchard a few uh, weeks ago, and I noticed that in the introduction, Evans Pritchard talks about his friend and, and how they started to do field work, and then uh, suddenly they had to interrupt the field work, and they had to be removed and taken to somewhere else, because the army or the police or the uh, authorities, I don't remember how he puts it, were looking for two prophets who were making lots of noise in that area. And then the prophets actually interrupted the field. 
And, and I thought, well, <laughs> why didn't you become interested in the prophet then? And, and I thought afterwards that maybe if we sent anthropologists to Palestine, uh, you know, through a machine of time, and, and we sent it to Palestine in, in, in 30 uh, uh, AC, they would come back and say, well, we're trying to do field work, uh, but, you know, we're very interested in, in, in direct rule and, and the politics of occupation of these Roman people. And, you know, there was this guy there, Jesus, I forgot his name. And, 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 and you know, the, Jesus, they would have missed Jesus. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, and, of course, they would have missed Socrates if they went to the studies of ethics in, 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 in Greece. And I will not continue. Uh, in fact, my colleague, uh, uh, Martin Hobart, has written about how anthropologists have a tendency to miss revolutions, and it is true that we have a tendency to study mechanisms of reproduction and social reproduction and mechanisms of continuity thinking, as uh, Joel Rogers has said. A little bit exaggeratedly, but uh, he's got a very good point. Now, um, in, in Africa, uh, this uh, neglect of the prophet, which is something I'm very interested in, the, the phenomenon of prophecy, the emergence of an individual a man or a woman very often who changes history, who changes perceptions, who changes rationalities in very Bavarian uh, terms, uh, uh, is, 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 is something I've been studying cross-culturally in Guinea, in Guinea-Bissau, in Angola, and in Congo. And, and this is made uh, even worse by the fact that we have this, uh, uh, and, and I mean, someone said, who you mean by we? Okay, we can discuss that as well, but I would just say, for a start, that we have a tendency to think of Africa in terms of collectivity. There's a very beautiful phrase by Ampate Ba, one of my favorite uh, histo local historians of, of, of uh, Niger. And Ampate Ba, uh, who was a collaborator of many anthropologists, French anthropologists, and who ended up being a consultant of, of the UNESCO, uh, wrote this very famous phrase which uh, says, in Africa, every, man, every time an old man dies, a library burns down. Which is a problematic enough metaphor in terms of what knowledge is really, how knowledge works. I mean, knowledge does not work like a library that you can download. And uh, Adam Jones, a historian, has already criticized the phrase on that, on that front. But uh, 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 my criticism to the phrase, or my usage, of the, my critical usage of the phrase, which is, I think is very beautiful, is that it talks about books, but not about authors. So who were the authors of those books that are burned down? Who wrote these books? Uh, and Ampateba doesn't tell us, because, like many of us, uh, he's thinking of Africa in terms of a collective wealth that is very often uh, a frame in terms of wealth in people, a phrase that is very common in African studies. You know, it's about having wealth in people. And, and, and actually, Jane Geyer, who was quite instrumental in making the concept wealth in people uh, uh, used, he actually prevented us. He, was, he told us that by using too much wealth in people, we forget the wealth in knowledge. And in order to learn about wealth in knowledge, you have to look at the individuals. My, my wife, for instance, who, uh, Marina Temudo, who's a specialist on, on rice farming innovation in, in Africa, she's very aware that people know very well who introduce a variety of rice, who introduce a variety of uh, technology of, of farming. And normally this gets inscribed in the name of the variety, for instance. So the individual who introduces a bit of knowledge is remembered, but the anthropologists don't care. And uh, Zoe Strozer, another of our dear colleagues in African studies, uh, an art historian, has written a very beautiful book, the title, I think says it all, Inventing Masks. So she goes against the grain of seeing masks as something that it's, you know, a, a, a manifestation of the collective consciousness, the collective representation, the mask, which is a representation of the art of the Zenufo or the art of the Baule. And she's actually looking at the individual who introduces a new form of mask. Where does this genius come from? Who is that individual? And she uh, writes very famously a phrase much cited that in Africa we have uh, the individual has been too absent. Um, it could be criticized, and I will not go into that, because in fact a lot of authors have written about the importance of the, of the artist 
like uh, William Fagg and, and, and Bicecon and, 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 and many others. But it is true that in general, the artist is unknown and the beauty of African art is that it's collective. And... Now, um, I've been studying this uh, uh, uncomfortable uh, situation uh, in the creation, invention, discovery, I mean, still don't know what's the best concept of a writing system in Congo, of an alphabet if you want, although I'm not even sure it's an alphabet. Um, I'm not sure about anything, uh, but it's a wonderful uh, uh, invention that has uh, been developed since 1978, um, when, uh, and, and, and then developed actually into two forms of uh, graphene, uh, of, of graphic arts, writing itself and, and, and drawing and art. Um, so that's why I like this concept of inscribing biographies, because inscribing is more than writing, it's, it's, it's making it inscribed in yeah. the seat of rice or a writing system that then be, uh, develops into art. The interesting thing about this writing system, which is called Mandombe, which means in Kikongo, the writing system of the African people, of the Ndombe, Sometimes in Congo they don't know how to translate in Dombe, whether it should be L'Africain or Le Noir. And they've come with this wonderful hybrid of uh, Negro African. Uh, so sometimes in Congo they call it Ecriture Afro uh, uh, Negro African. In any case, in Dombe is the indigenous people of Africa, and they have now uh, an alphabet in order to write their own alphabet with, sorry, their own writings with. And, and this alphabet was invented or discovered or, or created or maybe received from God by one single individual called Wabilagio Pai. So uh, over the last 10 years I've been working, uh, in fact 10 years exactly now, uh, on Wabilagio Pai. I had the pleasure and the privilege and honor to meet him and become a very, very good friend. I invited him to Europe many times, he invited me to Congo many, many times. We traveled together, we did pilgrimages together, we walked 60 kilometers on one occasion just to get to know the landscape uh, uh, of the places where he had received the revelation together. And, 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 and very, very sadly, he uh, died when he was quite young, uh, very, very sudden, and when we were actually already writing the book that was going to be his biography, and it was a collaborative project. Uh, that was about set six years ago, and this is probably the main reason why the book is not out. Uh, I have a lot of qualms and, and, and ethical uh, conundrums that, um, of course, should have been discussed uh, earlier this morning. Anyway, the uh, beauty about, about the alphabet was that it was uh, uh, created by this uh, young man at the time, he was only 21, in 1978, when he was looking at the, at the wall of bricks, and the lines that separate the bricks uh, uh, appeared to him as, as, as icons out of which he could combine and he made a kind of an, a, a, a combinatory art uh, out of which forms emerged and eventually uh, uh, um, letters as well. But he claims that it was God who asked him, it was God who told him I want to give something to you for your people and, and he prayed in front of that wall for nine months because God had told him that he had a message for him. So he himself always minimized his own agency. And this morning we discussed the very important notion of agency. In Wabelagio's case, case it's, it's quite significant that he minimizes his own agency in the invention of an alphabet for his people by saying, well, it's God who gave it to me. And in fact, a lot of people in Congo were very angry at him because they thought that he was very arrogant and that he was talking too much about he as the inventor of the alphabet, whether in fact it was God who invented it and, and, and gave it to the African people through him. And there was a tension uh, that was quite uh, important. I mean, he actually didn't make things easier because he introduced himself always as saying, my name is Wabelag Yopai, inventor. You see, Monsieur Wabelag Yopai, lavender. And, and this self-perception of inventor uh, made people think, well, you are very arrogant, you didn't invent anything, you received something. But in fact, what he invented was, was, was himself as part of, of, of the process of inventing uh, the, 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 the alphabet. So um, I think that 
Um, in, 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 in what will add you, this mind, we can see two tensions I want you to think about. On the one hand, the tension between revelation and invention, between, between his own agency and the agency of God, between he uh, as an actor and he as a recipient. But on the other hand, we have a, a, a tension that I as an anthropologist was very attentive to, which was the tension between what his family wanted of him, which was to become a trader, and what he wanted of him, which was to become an inventor of something, whatever he wanted to be an inventor. And these two tensions, uh, uh, as far as I am uh, aware, are uh, manifestations of a common structure of uh, uh, human uh, personhood. More than, a decade ago, more than a decade ago, I wrote an article uh, greatly inspired by Paul Riesman and by notions of Monday heroism. There's an article by, by Bert and Kendall called The Monday Hero, where they claim that notions of heroism in the Monday epic are always structured by two principles the centrifugal principle and the centripetal principle. The centrifugal principle makes the hero wants to go away and, and, and do something. The centripetal principle wants the hero to stay in the place and do something for the community. And according to Bert and Kendall, these two principles are uh, uh, transmitted th uh, through the father and through the mother uh, distinctly. And in fact, I mean, Bert and Kendall think in terms of you know, Africanizing these principles but in fact, you find exactly the same situation in the story of Esau and Jacob in the Bible, the centripetality of, 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 of Esau and the, sorry, of, of uh, 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 yeah, Esau and the centripetality of Jacob, who is then chosen by the mother to continue the lineage. And, and I think that this dichotomy between centrifugal and centripetal forces uh, uh, is present in, 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 in a lot of biographies we find in a lot of literature that we read, both uh, from Africa, from Europe, or from uh, elsewhere. The dichotomy um, is a, a, a tension, um, sorry, I'm gonna just finish reading this. Uh, I think that this uh, dichotomy between centripetality and, 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 and centrifugality is a, 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 a um, a universality that shows that all human lives are subject to a tension between the individual's imagination and the tyranny of the expectations that the group has on the individual, between one as self-made and one as made by the others. Um, so we could perhaps see that 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 that, uh, that Wabeladio, uh, my friend, was uh, a a in fear, in constant fear of being accused of being too centrifugal and therefore had to make efforts at being centripetal and, 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 and doing things for his, for his, uh, for his family, insisting that this invention was for the African people, not only for himself. Now, um, yeah, okay. Um, Yes, I would just finish by saying that, uh, of course, people my age, or maybe older even, uh, will remember that beautiful song by David Crosby, uh, called Almost Cut My Hair. And, and in fact, I think that, you know, that 1970s hippie hit uh, probably was getting much closer to my friend Wabiladio refusing to become a trader against the orders of his elders than many uh, 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 anthropological theories would allow us to think. Both were examples of individuals willing to become what we can use absolute beginners, uh, borrowing a beautiful title of a beautiful novel on London youth in the 1950s by, by, by McInnes, McKinnis, or rebels, but not rebels in a straightforward political sense, but in a metaphysical one, uh, 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 like the uh, meaning that the concept acquires in the writings of Albert Camus. Rebellious absolute beginners existed in London in 1959, in California in the 1970s, and in Bajangungu, where my friend was uh, uh, active, in uh, 1978. These, um, they have existed always in many other places, so they have existed in many other places, in times, and in the history of humanity. This universality and postulate does not mean that we should not take the local context of the birth of this writing system into consideration, 
quite the opposite. I'm an anthropologist. I'm a strong believer that it is only through the uh, localized examples that we can explore how universal trends express themselves. And this is what I'm trying to do with my now uh, uh, in the process of being written biography of, of, of Wabeladio, trying to show through one example some tendencies that I think are much more universal than we had assumed uh, in many of our anthropological uh, speculations about notions of personhood and of the self in African societies. Thank you. Thank you.